So, we are going to now look at uh, one of the most interesting things that has happened in the in the last one and half decades is that uh, the use of formal properties or assertions in design. So, the agenda for this chapter will be the following. We are first going to look at some of the uh, basic temporal operators which in addition to the Boolean operators uh, are part of what are called temporal logics. Then we are going to look at the, the logics for temporal specification. Then we will look at uh, one of the recent industry standards on assertions namely system Verilog assertions. And finally, we are going to look at some architectural styles for developing assertion IPs. Assertion IPs are essentially collections of properties that aim to achieve functional coverage of uh, some stated behavior. And the reference that uh, I am going to follow here is mostly from my book. So, why do we need temporal logic? So, let us look at the bulk of the design that is done is based on Boolean logic, right. So, what, what we have uh, is essentially Boolean formulas like for a half adder, you know if you have uh, the two operands and the carry out and the sum, then you can express the carry out and the sum as uh, Boolean functions like this. And when you have state machines, then you can still define that in terms of Boolean functions, where uh, you have the state machine uh, as a combination. Oops. Just let me select a pointer. Yeah. So, you have a typical uh, state machine can also be looked upon as some combinational logic and a set of flops, right and the output of the combinational logic is fed into the flops, right. And uh, the output of the flops also go back to the combinational logic. So, and there are certain uh, primary outputs. Now, in this scheme of things also the, the flop functionality is standard. So, there is nothing that has to be described here. And this logic is what is the main thing, this is the transition function of the state machine. And this again is specified in as a set of Boolean formulas, which defines the next state as a function of the present state and the inputs. Right? Now, why do we need to move from that to temporal logic? That is because we want to write behaviors, we want to depict behaviors which span across cycle boundaries that are going to talk about behaviors which span over many cycles. So, if I do this in this cycle, then in the next two cycles you should do that and then I will do something in the next to next cycle and things like that, right. So, that is what we mean by temporal that the behavior is not at a given point of time, but spans over some amount of time. So, for example, let us consider this property here of a two way round robin ar arbiter, which says that if the request bit R 1 is true in a cycle, then the grant bit G 1 has to be true within the next two cycles. Right? So, may not be in the next, but certainly within the next two cycles. So, that is a behavior which talks about behaviors uh, you know across more than one cycle. So, we define this in terms of we can think of this as temporal worlds. Now, now see that here R 1, R 2, G 1, G 2 are 4 signals and they are Boolean signals because they can only take value 0 or 1, but they can take different values in different cycles, right. So, if we look at the different cycles noted as time equal to 0, time equal to 1, time equal to 2 then you can think that these four variables take different values in different points of time, right. Now, essentially, so if you have to reason about this whole thing, 
the number of variables that you have here is not 4 anymore. It is 4 into the number of clock cycles because I can set R 1 to 0, R 1, R 1 0 to 0, R 1 1 to 1 and R 1 2 to 0. That means that you know that R 1 is going like this, like this, like this. Okay? So, that is the sequence if this one is 0, this one is 1, this one is 0. Right? So, it is the same variable which is taking different values over time. So, if we annotate the variable with the time index, then we get another variable which denotes the value of that variable at that time. Right? So, essentially there are more number of variables than just the 4 of them. Right? So, we could express this uh, requirement that R 1 is true in a cycle, then G 1 has to be true within the next 2 cycles in terms of first order logic also. So, those of you who have done a course on AI will uh, remember that you know in first order logic, we can say that for all times t, R 1 t implies G 1 t plus 1 or G 1 t plus 2. Right? which expresses the same intent as this property. But uh, we do not do that in temporal logic, we use propositional temporal logic right? and where the time variable t is implicit. Now, there is a very fundamental uh, reason for this. See, when we are dealing about time, okay, where, when we are dealing about temporal properties, the only variable uh, which actually change the basically time is the index on the basis of which these worlds differ. Right? We can express all these temporal properties using these variables and a special variable called time. Right? And then we can quantify time to say that always this is going to hold for all values of time. Right? or we can say that for some value of time this is going to hold. Now, first order logic in general, uh, if you want to prove something in first order logic, in general that is an undecidable problem. Right? This is a proven fact. So, therefore, uh, the complexity of reasoning in first order logic is quite high. On the other hand, we are dealing here with, with only one variable which is quantified namely the time variable t. So, if we can model that in terms of certain operators which talk about time, then we can do the reasoning at much less cost, which is why temporal logics have become popular and which is why the, the uh, the scientists who actually you know, constructed the first logics of this kind were very well appreciated and uh, Professor Amin Newelli, who was the originator of this uh, got the Turing award uh, several years ago, I think 1970 or something like that. So, uh, we can write the same intent as shown here as always R 1 implies next G 1 or next next G 1. See here, this for all t is captured by this or always. Always implicitly means that at all times, right? And when we say next g1, it means that at whichever time r1 happen in the next time g1. So if this happened at t, this is at t plus one, right? And then this is saying next next g1, which means that if this has happened at t, then this is at t plus 2. Right? Where? Okay, because see g 1 has to be true within the next 2 cycles. So, it has to be true in the next cycle or in the next to next cycle. Okay? That, that or is this. Let us look at this specification. Uh, design an arbiter with the following properties. Whenever R 1 is raised, the arbiter must assert G 1 within the next 2 cycles. This is the property that we saw just now. 
whenever R 2 is raised the arbiter must eventually assert G 2 and the grant lines G 1 and G 2 are never asserted together. So, let us say that these are the three properties that are given as part of the specification of the arbiter. Right? Now, look at this implementation. You know what we are doing in this implementation? We are giving G 1 and G 2 grants in alternate cycles. In one cycle we are raising G 1, lowering G 2. In the next cycle we are raising G 2 and lowering G 1. Right? We are just giving G 1 and G 2 grants in alternate cycles. Now, look at the funny thing here is that R 1 and R 2 have become inconsequential, we are not even reading it. Right? What does that mean? That means that this specification is not complete, you know, there, are, there is something missing in this specification because we could implement the specification without reading R 1 and R 2, I mean surely that was not intended. And look at this implementation which also satisfies all these properties. Now, this reads R 1, but does not read R 2. It reads R 1 and gives the grant G 1 in the next cycle if R 1 is asserted and whenever G 1 is not asserted, it just gives G 2 the grant. Right? Now, see both of these implementations satisfy this property and they are not logically equivalent. This is a very important thing. You can have two implementations of a multiplier, but both are logically equivalent. Right? There, if you look at the Boolean logic of each of them, if you look at the Boolean logic of two adders, it has to be equivalent because the function is completely defined. The adder function, addition function is a completely defined function. This is giving a partial definition, it is just saying that these properties must hold. Right? Now, that is not a bad thing because if you if your function becomes completely specified, then your room for optimization of the design is very limited. Right? But if your function is not completely specified, if it is partially specified, then within the possible implementations you can choose a good one. So, you can optimize in that space. Right? So, in general while we want our specifications to be functionally complete and to capture all the part of the design intent, it may not result in a complete functional behavior of the thing. It may not be able to specify for every scenario what are the outputs right? and that may be intended there may be do not cares. When we study uh, temporal logics, we interpret the semantics of the logic over what is called a Kripke structure. Now, it is a very simple kind of structure, it, it has the following uh, tuple, uh, AP is a set of atomic propositions, atomic propositions are some of the basic facts, you know, basic truths of some signals let us say. All right. These atomic propositions could be state variables themselves or they could be some logical functions derived out of the state variables. Right. S is a set of states, S 0 is a set of initial states and T is a total transition relation. Note a couple of interesting things here is that this is defined to be a relation not a function and what is the difference between the relation and the function that uh, if it is a relation then from one state you may go to more than one state also. Right? So, uh, it is not that every state gets mapped to an unique next state. So, you, this, this, this transition system is non-deterministic, right? it can be non-deterministic and the totality means that for every state you have to have a next state. 
right for every state there has to be a next state the next state could be itself also but there has to be some next state at least one next state there can be more than one possible next state also because the relation is non deterministic and then finally, we have L which is a labeling function from the set of states to the set of atomic propositions. Now, what does this mean that S uh, map to 2 to the power of, P of a p? It means that uh, you take suppose there are 5 different atomic propositions in each state those 5 different atomic propositions can take a combination of values. Right? So, the first proposition is true, second one is false. right? So, that is the labeling of the of that state. So, it, it gives you that what is the truth value of those propositions in the state, that is what the labeling function does. Now, in, in, in easier terms think of a finite state machine, where the output of the finite state machine is some function of the state bits. Right. Now, you can label the states with the values of the outputs. Right. So, the output variables are like your atomic propositions and they can be labeled on the states. Is that clear? So, that is that is what it means. Now, this is an example of a Kripke structure where you, we have these uh, 5 states S0 through S4 these are the transitions and these are the labels. So, P, Q, R, P, P, Q are the labels. Right? So, in this state P is true, in this state Q is true, whichever ones are not shown are false by default. So, here Q and R are false, here P and R are false. Right? So, that is the notation that we are going to use. A path in a Kripke structure, a path pi equal to n 0, n 1 and paths are by definition infinite. Right? In a Kripke structure is a sequence of states such that for all k, n k, n k plus 1 belongs to T. So, for example, uh, S 0, S 1, S 4, S 4, S 4, so that is this part. then stays here itself. Right? So, this is one path S 0, S 1, S 4, S 4, S 4, S 4, S 4, S 0, S 2, S 3, S 0, S 2, S 3, then S 0, then S 2, then S 3. So, it can keep on in this forever that is another path S 0, S 2, S 3, S 1, S 3, S 0. S 0, S 2, S 3, then S 1, then S 3, then S 0. Right? Can you tell me what is the number of possible paths? Finite or infinite? Finite? number of possible paths. Okay, now, look at this case. I start from here, okay, go here, right. then I go here and get stuck here. This is path 1. I start from here, go in this loop once, then go here path number 2. This is not the same as the previous path. I start from here, go in this loop twice and then go here. This is not same as the any of the two previous paths. So, how many paths can we have? Infinite, right. So, we can we can you know con con enumerate all the different types of paths that are possible, right. Now, so, so this is an infinite set of paths are possible. We define the prefix and suffix of the path as follows that for a given n k in the path pi, 
the prefix of n k is this the subsequence that is part of this path until it reaches n k and the suffix is another path which we call pi k. Okay. So, the suffix is the remaining path from here. Is that clear? Hmm? With that definition of a path, the prefix and the suffix, we now go into the take a look at the temporal operators. So, there are two fundamental path operators, one is the next operator and we will use uh, x p or the, or the operator x to denote the next. Okay. So, the next operator is this x okay. and then we have the until operator, this until operator denoted by this symbol u for until, which says that property p holds in all states up to the state where property q holds. So, p will continue to hold until we reach a state where q holds. Right? So, there are these are the two fundamental operators, one is the next and the other is the until. Right? Now, out of these we can derive some other commonly used operators like eventual operator, we will see how we can derive them out of these basic two, which says f p, f stands for future. Okay. So, this means that property p holds eventually at some future state and we have g p, which stands for globally. So, g p means that property p holds always at all state. But at all states, at some future state of what? Of a path. So, these are all interpreted over paths, these are path operators. Right? So, given a path, next p is the next state on that path. p until q is that p should hold in all states on that path until we reach q. If p says on that path, eventually we will get a state which satisfies q. G p says that on that path at all states p holds. Right? So, it is all based on a path. Right? All these operators are interpreted over paths of the underlying fit case structure. Temporal logics also support all the Boolean operators. So, in temporal logics we will have these fundamental operators and all the Boolean operators. So, and or not etcetera are all there. Now, let us look at these <coughs> operators. The first one is the x operator, the next time operator. So, in a path, it is true if p holds in the. Now, let us look at the formal uh, semantics of this. We have to start getting used to these notations because we are going to have these notations more and more often. Right? This thing this notation is called models, M O, I hope you can read what I am writing here, models. Okay. What does this mean? <coughs> so, we read it as pi, pi is our path, a path pi models x f, if and only if pi 1 models f. What is pi 1? Pi 1 is the suffix of the path pi starting from the state 1. So, remember this is state 0, this is state 1. Right? So, this is our pi 1. Okay. So, we uh, so essentially what, what, what we are saying is that the path, this whole path is going to model x of f if pi 1 
or the path starting from here models f. Now, be very careful about one thing is that remember that this f can in turn be a path property. It may not be something which holds on this state itself. It, if it is a Boolean formula, then it means that f must hold in this state itself. But if f is another temporal formula, then it might be holding on the path pi 1, not exactly on this state. Are, are you following what I am saying? Right? Yeah, let me repeat this because this is important. When I am saying x of f, right, there are two possibilities. f can be a Boolean formula. Suppose f, f is a and b, where a and b are two state variables. Then I can evaluate a and b here. If a, then what I am uh, what am I saying? I am saying a and b has to be true here because a and b is a Boolean formula. There is nothing that you need to do in the next cycles or anything. It is in this cycle that a and b both should be high. Right? Now, the second case is that if f is in turn a temporal formula, suppose f is x of p. Then, when I say that f must hold here, I am actually meaning that f must hold on this path. Right? So, so that is why I am not saying that if I if I if I call this n0 and n1, I am not saying that n1 models f, I am saying pi 1 models f. And what is this pi 1? It is the suffix of the path starting from this state. So, it is this path, the path which starts from here and the rest of it is this. So, I am saying that pi 1 must model f, I am not saying the state n 1 must model f. Right? It is a very important thing which you must not confuse later on, because then all your analysis is going to go away. Let us look at the until operator now. The p until q operator says that p holds until somewhere q holds. Right? Formally, we write the semantics like this pi models f until g if and only if there exists some k such that pi k models g. Can you tell me in this example what is the value of that k? 2, this is 0, 1, 2, right. So, pi 2 models g. Now, now here this, this picture shows that q is some proposition. So, it just holds here, but your g can again be an LTL property, or it can be a rather uh, another temporal property. So, it, it has to hold from here on. right? So, we say that there exists some k such that pi k models g and for all j, j less than k, that means all the states which precede this k, right? we must have pi j models f. Now, one thing that we will uh, see later on is that it could be possible that the witness for f takes longer than the witness for g. In other words, see, this, see the temporal property is satisfied over the temporal span of the property. right? So, for example, the, the property p until q here is satisfied over this. So, we have p p q, this is the witness. The witness is not a single state, the witness is this part, the subsequence. Right? Now, see when you have f until g, when you have f until g, 
it may so happen that f is a, is a temporal property, g is also a temporal property. So, f may hold from here to here, right, and then again f may hold from here to here, right, and g may hold from here to here. We will see examples of this happening later on, right. So, if the, the, the match of f actually takes place here, the match of f, the second f starting from here takes place here and the match of g actually ends before that. It can, it is possible that this can happen, right. So, that is why we do not say that for all j less than k n j models f, we say pi j models f, because this is pi 0 should model this f, pi 1 should model this f and then pi 2 will model g, right. Let us look at the eventual operator, the eventual operator says that p holds eventually in the future. So, somewhere in this path p must hold. So, formally we say that pi models f g, if there exists some k such that pi k models g, right. So, if you compare this with the previous thing, see this part that for there exist k such that pi k models g is actually what we have written here, right. So, not surprisingly that f g is actually a special case of this, where we just want to match this. It is a special case of until f g is a special case of until where we want to just match this. So, what do we use for f true which is you know true by default. So, therefore, f g in terms of the until operator is true until g right. So, true 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 g that is what we mean right. It is going to start from some true state true, 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 true and then g, wherever g holds, it holds. In the previous states, we are not checking anything. So, the property is true by default in the previous states, right. So, that is the semantics of the eventual operator. The always operator says p holds always at all states on the path, which in turn can be stated that not p does not hold eventually. We will never have not p. In the formal syntax, we write pi models g f if for all j we have pi j models f. Simple for all j, pi j should model f, which has the same meaning. Now, if we take this one that not p does not hold eventually, so this means that not f does not hold eventually. So, let us break this up, this says not f, what does this part say? It says that not f holds him eventually, but then we know that if it has to hold globally, then this can never be true. So, we put a not outside it. Right? So, now this we can write in terms of the until operator. So, we can write this as true until not f and then we put the not outside this. So, this is a representation of g, g f using just the not and the until operator. So, you see future and always operators can be expressed using the until operator and the boolean operator. So, x and until are the basic temporal operators.
there is a duality between the always and eventual operators and it is actually a variant of the de morgan's laws so let us see why that is so when we write eventually f what do we mean we means either f now or next f or next next f or next 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 f or dot 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 now we can use de morgan's here to put a knot outside and then this then move the knot inside so if we use de morgan's then this is not of not f and next not f and next next not f and next 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 not f etc right now what does this thing within the bracket mean it means always not f because this is not f and in the next not f and in the next to next not f and next 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 not f so everywhere not f so that's always not f so we have eventually f is not of always not f So now, with this, we can see that these two things will hold. So, not of f p is g of not p. So, what you do is, you, as you move the not operator inwards, the f becomes the g. So, f transforms to g, and then you have not p here. Right? Just like and or or and, they flip when you move the not. not operator across it when you apply de morgan's right so here it is just f is going to transform to g and g is going to transform to f right because over the temporal domain f is or and g is and like we see here right f is or and g is and hmm. and then similarly when you write not gp it is you are going to write it as f not of p right we can nest temporal operators like fgp what does this mean that along the path there exists a state from which p will hold forever so p holds here and then in all next states p holds so that is fgp what does gfp mean that always from every state in some future state p will hold so if i look at this state yes there is p in the future if i look at this state yes p is there in the future if i look at this state yes p is here itself so it's also in the future if i look at this state i should have a p in the future right so at every state there is some future state where p holds that is what is meant by gfp or in other words along the path p along the path p will hold infinitely often, often. it has to hold infinitely often right right now we are going to uh, i think we are not going to get into this because of the lack of time so in the next class we are going to look at the linear temporal logic and and branching time temporal logic and then we'll go into some of the industry standard languages for this